if I could kind of summarize it, you're asserting that typical mean variance optimization assumes that investors have exclusively mean and variance preferences. So on the risk side, we're only concerned about volatility. And um, what you've acknowledged explicitly with your model is the findings from behavioral um, behavioral economics and specifically prospect theory. So Kahn Kahneman, Tversky, um, and their acknowledgement that investors are more sensitive to downside risk than upside risk, and that they also exhibit this property, this behavioral property or characteristic called reflexivity, or no, re reflection, rather, reflection, reflection yeah. right? And um, so the utility function needs to account for both, for, for all three of variants, uh, a, a preference away from downside risk and um, this ref potentially this reflective risk as well, right? Um, so that's a core theme of your book. I know there's other there's other things to it, but I think that relates directly to maybe how you've manufactured this lineup of ETF. So why don't you go into how yeah. you think about the um, this utility maximization problem? Yeah. So. Well, before I forget, you're exactly right. Um, I think if you really ask the question of, of, of what are human beings' preferences, then this sort of, you know, mean variance, um, rational investor, which, you know, the utility function for that was created in the early 1900s and economists just ran with it. Um, it doesn't really represent human beings well. Uh, and, and so we, we know that that well now. And so right when you get into that, you, you, you really start to yeah, quickly beg the question of um, where are the investment products, right? You can, you can build the asset allocation framework, but should we be focusing on investment products that can more directly speak to these asymmetric preferences? So spot on on that. So um, well, I guess let's roll back to kind of like the, 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 the very beginning of the book, um, which is ans asking the question, how do you build, what does it mean to build a portfolio for someone, investment portfolio for someone, you know, how do you, how do you take someone's brain and soul and whatever, and, and say, this is the right portfolio of investment holdings for you. And, you know, to our best knowledge, the way to do that is to define a utility function for a human being and then try to maximize that utility. So, um, I don't know if that's the best thing to do. I don't know if that's going to be around in 500 years from now, but sort of to the best of our knowledge today in, in economics, that's that's how you map um, a person to an investment portfolio. And the core um, way that we operate today in wealth management is we really don't account for the two dimensions of the utility function that prospect theory has, the reflection and the loss aversion, we really just have that, that singular risk aversion parameter. Um, and the whole industry uh, runs off of that and, and people are sort of binned into risk tolerance bins. And you know there might be four or five portfolios that a firm offers and you're just sort of slotted into one. Um, but we know humans aren't, aren't like that. And so the, the first thing to going from A to Z to build a portfolio for someone is to say, you know, what is your utility function? That's like the first, the first step. And then, like you said, there's a bunch of other steps we have to go through, but that's, that's the starting point. And there's also a huge topic of how do you actually measure the three parameters, right? I think everyone is very familiar with how you measure. Well, let me rephrase that. Everyone is familiar with sort of how people measure your risk tolerance today, but I would challenge that the way that's done is probably has massive error bars on it. And I don't, I don't think that there's been nearly enough research into that. And, you know, I think ask your neighbor, ask anyone um, if they filled out a, a risk tolerance questionnaire at their broker and they'll, you'll generally get the same answer, which is, uh, yeah, I was asked a couple questions. Do, you know, am I scared of losing money or, you know, do I like uh, gambling? And um, from my perspective, being a scientist, it's really hard to imagine how that's like a, a real sort of uh, medical grade test. So I, I think there's two really important things to, to consider here that the book is trying to take a step forward on, which is um, 
what is the starting utility function we should consider? How many parameters are in, are in it? And then how do we how do we measure it? Um, and and yeah, the the world is 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 there's a ton of loss aversion in the world, and when we don't correctly account for it, we'll build uh, portfolios that are not appropriate for people. You know, think about two thousand eight. Think about the stories of people who. Uh, went to cash in 2008 and didn't get back invested into equities for five, six, seven years. Um, we've all heard the stories. And I think uh, really what you're seeing there is that people's loss aversion was mis misdiagnosed and they got incredibly scarred. Um, and they would have been way better off having a proper diagnosis of loss aversion, having their equity allocation probably dialed back from 60 to 30% or 40%. And then they would have stayed in and they would have done a lot better. Right. So uh, I think it'd be helpful. And I was actually trying to log in to, to see if I could I could show the chart from your book. But I think it would be helpful to sort of describe um, a typical I found the chart in your book to be helpful in understanding these concepts. Right. So a typical utility curve is shaped sort of like a parabola, because the idea is that an investors, the marginal utility of an extra dollar of wealth declines as an investor's wealth increases, right? So if you offer an investor who's a multimillionaire the opportunity to to play a lottery for $10 or $1,000, he the value of that extra $1,000 is less to that multimillionaire than it would be to somebody who lives below the poverty line, right? Um, so you've got this sort of diminishing return on extra wealth and what I what I found interesting in the chart that you showed was when you introduced this idea of loss aversion, when the potential for um, for for losing wealth is introduced, or, or or the part of the curve where you're losing wealth, that that the utility drops off very very steeply, um, much more steeply than for a normal um, log utility curve, right? And and then for this reflective quality. I guess the the curve almost has a bit of an S shape, right? S shape, yeah. So, so what is? I think that it's it's the, the loss aversion parameters. I think a little bit more easy to, to comprehend visually yeah. and and internalize. The the reflective one I think would requires a little more explanation. So maybe maybe pull on that thread a little bit. Yeah, this is like um, kind of like a like a fear of missing out type of behavior and it'll actually put you into higher risk portfolios and you know i think the easiest way for me to think about it is let's say you have a uh, an asset you know um in your portfolio that's like down 30 percent you know do you want to kind of stick with it and roll the dice and this thing could go down you know could be cut in half from there <clears throat> or do you want to kind of roll the dice and see see if you can get back to even or or even better so um, I, I think, you know, holding on to losers, uh, you know, we're all, we're all told to cut losers and hold on to winners. And this is the opposite, right? And this is what, what a lot of people do demonstrate. They, they hold on to losers, hoping to get, get back to even or still, or still be sh proven correct. Right. Uh, so that, that's, that's exactly what that, that risk seeking behavior is in the loss domain. Right. So I, yeah. I thought. That was all very intuitive, and I thought it was neat how you incorporated directly the um, the findings from behavioral economics. One thing I was curious about, I mean, having worked with clients for many years directly, one thing that we noticed, because we've always been focused on mean variance optimization and, and perhaps overly myopic on that objective um, from a practice standpoint, but... Um, one thing we've especially noticed is that investors are also very attuned to what the market is doing, right? So we've always contemplated, and I know um, Corey Hofstein, for example, has done some work on this on on the Weird portfolio, which jointly optimizes to va mean variance optimize or mean variance utility, but then also optimizes to um, mean tracking your utility against, for example, the S and P or uh, a U.S. sixty forty portfolio. Did you did you contemplate this, or is this something that you've obviously observed in the literature the way we have? 
um, experience directly with clients? And, and is this something that you contemplated including with your model? It, if not, or if so, why? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I didn't. Um, I guess I just didn't find the right, and, and to be fair, it's not something I've sort of looked at exactly. So, um, but I, I guess sort of falling out of the academic literature and sort of the process I went through to try to put together this sort of best practice workflow from end to end, um, it, it didn't fall out to me uh, as sort of the path I, I wanted to take to, to manage clients. So um, for better or worse, I was probably going through sort of an overly pedantic and potentially a bit academic of an exercise to create this sort of end to end workflow. And so um, that's why it probably smells like that. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I, again, it was, it, was, it was intuitive and I appreciated the connection to behavioral economics. And um, I, I also think that it would have been interesting to explore adding an extra dimension to the optimization to account for um, sensitivity to, to tracking error aversion, like just adding an extra term. And um, to your point, then you can probably measure this using similar type of lottery oriented questions to capture the beta of a of an investor's utility curve to that specific dynamic as well right which dovetails nicely into um it's like another it's like another dimension of behavior i think exactly right exactly and, and it's and you're like let's go from three to four parameters dave let's do this <laughs> it's, it's it's shockingly important though you know and I, I i agree obviously moving into more and more parameters the, you get into dimensionality challenges with the amount of data you have. And I mean, there's lots of, exactly. there's lots of issues on, on all sides, but this has been I an especially it. interesting uh, observation for us as, you know, people who've worked directly with clients over the years and we run mostly uh, strategies that are not really oriented towards traditional portfolios. So this has been acutely urgently in our, um, in our site so for, for more sensitive to it. Yes. Right. You see, you might be more sensitive to it. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. For sure, for sure. But yeah. either way, I think it's it's um I was really enamored also with the way that you try to attack measuring a person's uh risk preferences using the lottery based uh surveys. Maybe you go into that. What was your thinking on that and how do they work? Yeah, I think um, you know, intuitively uh, these sort of, you know, Grable Litton-esque questions that the industry has just grossly adopted over the last two decades, um, which seem very um, qualitative and, and there's a sort of a lot of self-diagnostics in there. They just didn't really hit me as very, um, as really having the potential of being very accurate. And at the same time, I think the way people have uh, aggregated different questions and just sort of squished them together in terms of, you know, let's say you answer four questions on risk tolerance. If you flag as a four out of four on each one, you add it up to 16. And just, just adding up a series of questions also doesn't seem like sort of a very rigorous um, kind of aggregation system, especially if there's like multiple dimensions in there. So if you look carefully at the risk preference diagnostic literature for these like Grable Litton type questions, they actually have loss aversion questions in the list buried and they identify them as such. But as you know, since loss aversion makes the utility function fall off, a, it can make it fall off a cliff really aggressively, way faster than risk aversion can. Then if you have 10 questions on a list and two are about loss aversion and you flag as very loss averse, well, that's just two out of 10. So it's only going to maybe bring down your like, effective risk aversion by like 20%, but yet we know the utility function can be like triple as low. Mm. So there's there's also this really obvious aggregation challenge in the industry uh, with these types of questions. So the only way I could see um, from the literature to do this accurately is to diagnose each parameter very independently uh, and really try to specifically uh, diagnose each parameter and these lottery style questions are are out there and you can map each one of these questionnaires to a, sp a very specific parameter so i know that i'm not just kind of taking like a, a, a like a fluffy question about diagnosing your own risk and then having to map it 
somehow qualitatively again, so two qualitative st steps uh, to a parameter. I actually have this thing that is incredibly precise as long as I can solicit the, the response properly from someone in a good state of mind. I mean, there, there's, there's plenty of other error that can come in, but at least I know that um, if you switch, you know, on the, like for instance, on the loss aversion questionnaire, if you're willing to take a bet that's a two to one payoff, but not one that is 1.5 to one, then I know your loss aversion is two to one. It's just the ratio of those two things. It's very mathematical. Right. Um, so that was also really attractive. So independently, me independently measuring them, and then also trying to use a questionnaire that that is at least trying to be accurate from the start. Yeah, no, I thought that was really intuitive. Um, and you do discuss at length, and I think very thoughtfully, the, this idea of the validity of a, of a test, right? And um, and I think you acknowledge explicitly, and I'd uh, be interested in your, in, your, in your take on this, but um, I mean, one of the reasons why traditional surveys are not very effective is that A, they don't measure explicitly the, the, the right dimensions of risk, but also because investors are not very good at conceptualizing or identifying their true tr emotional triggers. You know, like you, you ask a person in a calm emotional state to evaluate how they were, will feel when they're on tilt. And those don't off, I mean, in, in my experience, they just don't map very well in, in many cases. And I, I know that your, uh, your attempt at this doesn't make that any worse. Like there's no, there's nothing about your method that is, that is any worse at capturing that than any other method. That is just an omnipresent challenge. Do you feel that your approach closes the gap though, in a way that some of the more um, prosaic surveys don't? I, I hope so. Uh, that's definitely one of the hopes. And I'm, I'm working closely um, with a psychometric testing firm. Uh, and and I, I did sort of throughout the book, we, we've um, surveyed the questionnaires and we've done a lot of data work on that. And, and we're going to be publishing that soon. Uh, the psychometric testing company is called ACS Ventures. Uh, and their expertise is on reliability, validity, and, and studying these things. And so we'll be releasing some data and analysis on that soon. And I, I, I think we're doing a pretty good job and we stack it against Grable, the in-type questions and everything. So uh, I think we'll have some exciting news to share on that front. So how do they measure that? I'm curious. I mean, uh, I'm not sure just how deeply you've been involved with, with what they do, but I mean, I would expect that they would measure people's response to these surveys and then observe their behavior in different market conditions and, and see how well their responses map to their behavior in, in these conditions? Or is there another method that they use? Yeah, I, I think there's a, a bunch of ways to do it, which I think is a whole nother podcast. Um, and, and it goes off the, the deep end a bit quickly. Uh, but, you know, the, the thing I'll bring up on this that I, I think is, is overwhelmingly interesting um, is that I don't know if you saw, you probably saw this part of the book. Um, and this is sort of, I think is an interesting challenge to the whole industry is the, the, the part where I went through how, when you uh, give one of these questionnaires with small amounts of money and fake dollars, how you're not soliciting accurate uh, results, answers. But then if you scale those numbers way up, but they're still fake, you're, you're still not soliciting accurate results. But then if they're real dollars and very large, then all of a sudden the answers change and you start to get more real uh, uh, answers and accurate answers. And so it, it's, I find this really funny, and but very interesting, you know, uh, the, the way you should do your first meeting with your client is you, you know, snap your fingers and their bank accounts on the table. And then you snap your fingers and your bank accounts on the table and you say, look, to do this well, somebody's going to lose money right now, but we're going to go through these questionnaires, but this is as real as it gets. <laughs> so it's literally um, the only way to actually get the, get close to a person's true risk preferences. And even then, it assumes that risk preferences are stationary in time, right? Like uh, that people don't get more or less risk averse 
in different market right. conditions or different phases of their life or, or what have you, right? So, and I think you did a good job of, of suggesting that advisors should be administering these tests to clients regularly so that, yeah. you know, they can yeah. sort of triangulate the true preferences over time. Minimally, yeah, mi minimally over sort of, you know, big market around big market events, um, big life events, you know, per personal events can really change things. So I, I think as long as you, as long as you try to administer it sort of around those big events, um, you'll be in pretty good shape. And, and a lot of it is, is, is also educational for them just to be able to say, Hey, look, all of my clients loss aversion went up 50% over the last right. two months. You're not right. different. Here's a chart of my whole client base. And you know, that's, that's incredibly uh, interesting education. And, and, and also just on the three different parameters, educating clients on loss aversion, for instance, I think that also is uh, something that's, that can be really educational for clients. And um, thus far, what I've seen from advisors who have, have used the software and have deployed this with, with clients, um, I, I think clients really feel like the advisor is getting to know them a lot better and is and and the client is seeing a window into the advisor sort of caring and really getting involved and the advisor explaining things to them so um you know for instance a story i like to tell on this front is um i was doing a demo with some advisors and we did we we, we measured everyone's loss version and then we had everyone take the the their phones out of their pocket and look at their cell phone cases and it was a really nice correlation between, um, you know, the highly loss averse people had these very large cases on their phones. And then the guy that had like absolutely no loss aversion, maybe even the opposite somehow. No case. He had two iPhones with no cases on yeah. them. <laughs> you know, work in a personal no case. Um, and, and so when you start to tie these parameters into real life, and and you and, and the advisor really gets to understand what these parameters are and they can make those parallels and and clients can start to see how they exhibit loss aversion in their everyday life you know do you how much insurance do you take out uh for x y or z and what's the what's the you know what's the the national average and where you know um there's a lot of really interesting content and it it, it really empowers the advisor and the client to to really engage the portfolio i think in a more meaningful way Oh,